So thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm really excited to share this work with you guys. Um, if you're here for the component model, you are in the wrong room. So today I'm gonna to be talking about some work uh, that, oh, I'm Tal Garfinkel, I'm at UC San Diego. Um, I'm gonna be talking about some work that has been done in collaboration with uh, colleagues all over the place. Uh, so credit is all spread out. And um, the thing I'm gonna be talking about is, right, so uh, WebAssembly is, is kind of this amazing technology from an isolation standpoint, right? It uh, gives us overheads that are orders of magnitude less than what are possible with existing hardware isolation mechanisms. And this has enabled all sorts of very cool use cases. Um, unfortunately, right, like, we all, uh, Wasm also has some you know, fundamental limitations today in terms of security, scalability, uh, performance, um, and like some other attribute that, oh, compatibility, there we go. <laughs> um, and so I'm gonna talk about two things. First, I'm gonna talk about a couple of optimizations uh, on current hardware um, techniques called Segway and ColorGuard um, that give us a really nice boost in terms of performance on yeah, existing x86 machines. Um, potentially we could apply this on ARM as well. Um, it cuts about 25% of the kind of virtualization tax or you know, kind of wasification tax versus native off of uh, workloads. Um, and the other one called ColorGuard uh, lets us uh, increase the number of uh, instances we can run by about a factor of 12. So addresses performance scalability. After that, I'm gonna be talking about hardware bit assisted fault isolation, which is uh, an extension to um, modern processors that we've been working on for a couple of years uh, with Intel, uh, collaboration with other colleagues. And it's a very simple set of extensions. That's kind of exactly what we want for um, addressing kind of all these problems uh, in the WASM space. So WASM enables uh, many cool use cases, um, as I talked about, and again, it's because of these unique properties. And these unique properties are, right, like, you know, instance creation that is orders of magnitude lower than what you're gonna be able to do on something like Lambda, right? Microsecond scale, um, nanosecond scale context, which is very small footprints. Um, and all of this, uh, makes it possible to do these like um, high concurrency, low latency uh, edge compute platforms like we're seeing from folks like uh, Cloudflare, Fastly, right? You, you couldn't do this with existing hardware. Um, another very cool thing uh, that this has enabled is um, allowing us to do compartmentalization of untrusted code, right? So for the last few years, we've been working with uh, the really great folks in Mozilla um, on sandboxing untrusted libraries, right? So they depend on all sorts of third-party libraries that are written in C. You guys may have begun to the RL box top earlier in the week. Um, and the reason we're able to do this is really because of WebAssembly, right? People have tried to sandbox stuff with processes for the last two decades, for as long as I've been in security, and it really doesn't work out. And it's because um, inter-process communication is so expensive with processes, you have to refactor your whole application. And so most people just don't do it, right? Like, you know, things like uh, OpenSSH or browsers use of processes are really the exception uh, rather than the norm. Unfortunately, right, so WASM has these fundamental limitations in terms of performance, scaling, security, and compatibility. And you know, I don't, I don't let this get me down, right? So my background is in virtualization. I was there in the early days of virtualization. And when I started working on virtual machines, right, the overhead for using a virtual machine was 30%. So when I'm like, you know, 20% for Wasm, I'm like, eh, wait five years, it'll be okay. <laughs> um, but there, so there are some real, real challenges here to tackle. Um, and this is what I'm gonna talk about. So first I'm gonna talk about these limitations, these optimizations, and then finally what we're doing in hardware. Really quick review, just in case you didn't take uh, undergrad computer architecture recently, um, right? Page tables, this is what uh, containers and virtual machines use. You're gonna go get an address. It's gonna, you know, you do a load or a store, it's gonna look at the address. Part of that's gonna be the virtual address uh, that's gonna identify the page that you're after, and the rest is gonna be the offset into that. You're gonna go to the TLB. Um, hopefully you hit the TLB. If not, you're gonna go look it up in a page table in main memory do some permission checks, and that's gonna actually have be how you translate your physical address. And the reason I'm kind of bringing this up is because these are the building blocks that we're gonna talk about, so I just want you to like page this back in. That's one way to do memory protection. The other way people usually do memory protection is segmentation. And when I say usually, a lot of old hardware did this. If you are old like me, you remember doing this on the x86. Um, this is largely not in the x86 anymore. But the basic idea um, is, right, that you have um, you describe your memory in terms of extents, right? In terms of a base and a bound. 
So you're like, I want to you know, grant access to this base and bound, and um, if I'm going to load an address, I'm going to look, depending on how I'm doing addressing, if I'm doing segment relative addressing, I'm going to say, starting at the beginning of the segment, you know, where is my address in this thing? If it lands in that thing, um, uh, you're going to allow it. Otherwise, uh, you're not going to allow it. There's going to be some permissions. Um, and your address is going to be uh, done relative to the start of that segment. Sorry, I hope that wasn't too brief. Why am I bringing this up? Like, what is WebAssembly doing? And I think one way to think about uh, WebAssembly is kind of like a poor man segmentation, right? We're taking hardware which no longer does segmentation for us, and we're using the compiler to do, give us a segmented memory model instead. And the dope thing about a segmented memory model in software is that it lets us avoid the overheads of hardware, right? It lets us avoid the TLB flushes, the TLB shootdowns, um, context switch overheads, right? All of these things that happen when you get involved with traditional hardware production. Um, unfortunately, right, there are trade-offs to this, right? So there's two ways that we can implement this. The simplest thing we could do, right, would be let's just add an upper bounds check and a lower bounds check to every load and store instruction. Um, and of course, you can do this, but it's expensive. Um, and of course, this is also not specter safe. So what most uh, WASM runtimes are doing, um, if you're running Chrome on your browser on a 64-bit machine, if you're using WASM time in the cloud, is a system of what are called guard regions. And so the way that guard regions work, right, is you're like, well, I've got a four gig address space. I'm gonna allocate another four gigs after that for my guard region, because I'm gonna take my 32-bit uh, offset that I'm gonna load, I'm gonna add that to a 32-bit heap base, I'm gonna get a 33-bit value, um, eight gigs, right? And so my accesses are gonna land in my guard, in my uh, address space, or it's gonna land in my guard region. If it lands in my guard region, it, it will trap. Um, there are other things that are done to actually control the end of your heap. Um, so, this is great. This is much more efficient than those conditional checks. Um, there are costs in terms of uh, startup, slowdown, and resize because you're still involved with the MMU and still making system calls. And this wastes a lot of virtual memory, um, which impacts scaling. And finally, this is also not specter safe. So more about this. So uh, these scaling limitations, right? Right now, right, if you kind of do your basic math, two to the 47 size virtual address space, uh, in user space on x86, um, you know, two to the 33 size uh, of virtual memory for each instance, right? Two to the 14 is 16K. If you organize things a little bit more efficiently, uh, you can get about 20K, but that's the most WASM instances you're gonna pack into that 128 terabyte virtual address space, which is, you know, kind of depressing when you think about it. Um, so this is a bummer if you're doing serverless and every request you are spinning up an instance, right? Like if, you know, if you're Fastly, right, this is a problem. Maybe for Cloudflare, this is a problem. Um, and this problem is going to get worse with the component model, right? Because instead of each of your applications being one linear memory, maybe each of your applications is 10 linear memory. I don't know what your applications look like, but I feel like anytime I compile something, like the, the list of dependencies gets quite large. Um, so scaling, I think, is, is, is already a problem and it's going to become a much bigger problem. Another thing is that guard, we don't always get to use guard regions, right? If you want to do 64-bit memories, we're back to those conditional bounce checks, right? 64-bit memories on, on WASM, not efficient. Um, and this also doesn't work on 32-bit processors. And, and we personally care about this because uh, we ship sandboxing on Firefox to older desktop machines, and there's a really a lot of Android devices in the world that are still 32-bit. So this, this directly impacts us, and we, we have to pay that tax. Um, and, and linear memory checks, I'm still adding a heat-based addition to every load and store, so there's a, there's a cost associated with this as well. And finally, we can't support uh, all the things out there. Uh, some of this, right, uh, there's a lot of really great work uh, going on in terms of standards efforts to, to address this. Some of this will never be addressed, and um, yeah, this is just, you know, it's a limitation. So next, so let's talk about these optimizations. Again, segue. It's a, Fun trick you can play in your runtime uh, that speeds up WASM. Um, color guard, something that gives you great scalability, right? And so segue is just a cute trick of using, a um, cute way to use x86 segmentation. So if you're old, who remembers a 32-bit segmentation in x86? <laughs> you. <laughs> that guy over there, right? Like, um, right, like, so, um, right, so if you, if you remember this, right, like, back in the day, right, everything was, you know, you're using segments for all sorts of things, it was great, and in 2003, um, when AMD released uh, x86-64, right, they, they, they took this out. 
um, mostly, right? So your, your uh, segment registers are, are still there, but most of them uh, just zero relative address. Most of the other segmentation hardware was, so you could do more sophisticated things, those things are gone. Um, but we still got two segment registers le left that actually do something, and this is FS and GS, right? And the one thing that they do is segment relative addressing. And what operating systems use this today, for today is thread level storage, right? So if you're accessing thread level storage, what your compiler is doing is uh, doing segment relative addressing relative to either FS or GS, and which of those uh, it's using is de depends on which operating system you're running on. Um, but uh, we have one segment register left. And we can actually reuse the other one too if we're careful. And so Segway reuses this remaining segment register for heap-based addition, right? Really simple idea. But the cool thing about this is this frees up a general purpose register, um, and this enables more optimized instruction encoding. And so what is the consequence? Well, if we look at kind of the before and after, we can see we have an extra instruction, and we're using the extra register, and we can get rid of both of those um, and give our compiler more freedom um, when we're using Segway. And you can look at our paper on this for more details. It gets gory. Um, so what is the goodness we get from this? Number one is we get a uh, code size reduction, which is very cool because we're shrinking the number of instructions that we have. Good for our iCache. Um, this gives us a nice speed up on spec. Um, and uh, when we've looked at application specific, specific applications, we've seen kind of even bigger speed ups. Um, and right now, actually, this is shipping in, in, uh, in Whammer. And I really wanted to call out this thing about reducing compilation times because we have no idea why this actually is the case. It, it just is. And when they you know, posted this, we we're like, this is great. Uh, it's, it's good. Our optimizations are making the world better in ways we didn't even know. <laughs> so um, good. So let's segue. So the second thing I want to talk about is color guard. This is something that helps scalability. And So more, more review. And so this is a very, very simplified way, uh, view of memory protection keys. But so going back to our page table, right? So each page table entry right, is there for doing virtual address translation. And memory protection keys adds four bits to each page table entry. And these four, four bits we refer to as a memory tag. And we can think of this in terms of colors. So think of this as like we have 15 different colors. And each of our pages are colored with a different color, kind of like is depicted here. And on each of our cores, we will have a register that says, OK, this is the color of my core right now. Let's say thread, uh, in, you know, for those who are into high-level abstractions. So, um, uh, so right, if my, my register says I can access blue memory, then I can only access blue memory. So how is this useful? How, how can this help us? Well, so I talked about the way that we use guard regions in WASM. Right? And how that works right, is that um, we are, for each of our instances, essentially burning 8 gigs worth of space. And it's not totally burning, right? Some of that address space I'm going to use. But usually, like a WASM instance, like maybe using a couple hundred megs of my virtual address space, maybe more, maybe less. But then all that other space, my guard region and the rest of my virtual address space, I'm not getting any value from that. So let's say instead, what if I could use, instead of wasting that, I could put other VMs there. And this is what color guard is letting us do. So what we're doing is we're saying, OK, now that we have these colors, let's say I have like one VM, this is my blue VM, and then if I have, say, one gig VMs, I'm going to put seven other VMs beside it that are different colors. And that way, again, right, if I kind of going back to, I'm going to do my heat-based addition, and I'm either going to land in my blue VM, or I'm going to land in a different color. And so this way, I'm getting that same property that I got from those guard regions, right, that same nice trick for accelerating bounce checks, but now I'm not wasting the space. Um, yeah, unique colors to each sandbox, and we can just kind of repeat this uh, pattern of uh, you know, different colors uh, on each side uh, over and over again in memory. And so kind of the punchline to this, right, if we, if we, so starting out, so if you're WASM time and you've done the smartest thing you can do, and you're like, I'm going to put, I'm going to use unsigned addition instead of signed addition. I'm going to use two gig guard regions on either side. So I'm going to do four gigs, two gigs, four gigs, two gigs. I can pack, you know, roughly 20K instances into that process address space. And with color guard, uh, with half gig sandboxes, now I can do a quarter of a million sandboxes. So that's kind of a, a really nice uh, win in terms of scaling. Um, again, this is on Intel MPK. Um, this is also available on AMD since. Uh, Epic Milan, 
So it's on a lot of hardware right now, um, and I think that we will be able to do this with ARM memory tagging uh, hardware uh, when it is finally available. So now I'm going to talk about uh, what we can do in next generation processors. So you know, after working with this for a few years, we're like, man, like we really need some help from hardware to overcome these limitations. And um, so this is a result of a multi-year uh, collaboration. Uh, Shravan in the back uh, <laughs> did a lot of that great work. Um, uh, worked with great folks at Intel and Rivos, some of the other folks I listed at the beginning. So what do we want from hardware? So we wanted, hard, like, we wanted three things from a hardware design. Number one, we want it to be dead simple, right? And, and there's a, like, a lot of good reasons for this. Number one, we want to be able to run on low-end hardware, um, like IoT devices, and we want to be able to run on state-of-the-art server class processors. Um, right, and we just, like, you know, as one architect put it, right, like, when you're putting stuff on the data path, this is kind of the Manhattan of chip real estate. So, like, you know, every gate, you, you better have a really good reason for, for putting it there. Second thing we wanted was minimal OS changes. Right, if you kind of follow along with the Linux kernel and like how long it takes for uh, a feature to get into the Linux kernel, right, it took years and years to get MPK in there, and there is still no MPK support in Windows. Right? So if you want to have impact with a hardware feature, like staying user space, staying out of the way of the kernel is the way to go. Third thing we wanted was we wanted to be able to support um, several critical use cases. Number one, we want to be able to support Wasm, right? And there's things you just want for Wasm that are different from, you know, a cherry, from like all these other different compartmentalization mechanisms, because we've got to trust a compiler. We want to be able to sandbox uh, unmodified native binaries, um, right? Sometimes, right, you've got a system library, we just be able to like be loaded in from like our weird world, weird world of using Wasm for uh, sandboxing legacy code, this is something that we really needed. And you know, if you're in the serverless space and you're like, hey, I want to be able to run like a Java JIT, and <laughs> that's also a really nice thing. And finally, we want to be able to support custom SFI systems, right? custom isolation systems. So like, uh, V8 has their own sandboxing system called UberCage that they use to contain JIT vulnerabilities. And you know, we, we talk with those guys, and they're like, you know, we're like, what do you want? And they're like, we want that thing you want, you're doing, and we're like, awesome. So anyway, there's a lot of love. So, um, so we want to support these two environments, and it's interesting, right? Like, with when we can trust the compiler, we can uh, do optimizations that are not possible with native, right? Because we can trust the compiler, right? We can we have this finite set of resources to in, in, uh, to enforce isolation, and we can let the compiler manage those and uh, you know spill them, and um, you know we get a lot of flexibility from that. Uh, but we also want to support native binaries, right? So we're, we're trying to support both of these requirements. So our solution is hardware-assisted fault isolation. And what does this give us? Um, so this provides uh, fast, secure um, isolation and sharing. So memory isolation uh, is free, right? There is no overhead for balance checks at all um, because of the fact that we uh, carry those checks um, in parallel with that TLB, TLB lookup, right, where uh, we fit within the amount of time it takes to execute that pipeline stage, uh, so we don't add any overhead. Um, we can enable zero copy sharing. We can map stuff in and in and out of the sandbox in user space um, uh, without touching page tables. Um, system call position for almost no overhead, which is great for native binaries, uh, and we've got specter safety. And if you want to talk more about that offline or question time, we can talk about that because it's a, it's a nuanced issue. Um, we can also do unlimited scaling, right? We can put you know, as many one meg sandboxes into your virtual address space as you want, right? There's no, no tax for that. Um, I don't want to do the math on that, but it's a lot. Um, and we can do near zero cost sandbox setup, teardown, and resizing, right? Because we're no longer involved with making system calls and messing with the MMU and TLB shootdowns um, when we're trying to uh, set up and tear down these address spaces. So we're kind of at like language speeds for doing uh, these kinds of uh, operations. And finally, we can provide compatibility with existing code. So the architecture itself is very, very simple, right? Sort of, we have this notion of regions. Um, regions are, again, like base bound pairs. It's like, like segmentation, right? We set up our regions. We say, here's our virtual address space. I'm gonna you know, map this range, this range, this range into my sandbox. When I say HFI enter, the only thing that my code can access now is those ranges of memory. I execute my sandbox code. When the guest called HFI exit, it hands control back to some trusted runtime, my Wasm runtime, 
or other runtime. So, so there's additional details. I'll talk about some of those later, and then again, hopefully, I'll have time questions. Um, so one of the challenges here, right, is that um, if you want to naively do this, you're like, well, I have regions. I'm just going to do, you know, two, you know, 64-bit comparisons, right? Base and bound. That's fine, right? And th that's not going to work out. Um, because that's a lot of circuitry. Again, we have this constraint. We have to fit within the amount of time that it takes one pipeline stage to execute. And we can't um, afford that amount of time that it would take to do those comparisons. Um, also, we can't uh, like afford that amount of circuit area. So we need to find some way of doing this that is cheaper. And our answer to this is to specialize regions. right? So we have a variety of different types of regions that give us um, flexibility, but then also uh, let us use less hardware to implement these checks. The first type of region is called an explicit region. And this is um, segment relative addressing, right? So um, we have four of these, and this is great for like implementing a WASM heap. We have a choice. We can either have these you know, address more memory and have 64K um, uh, sized and aligned um, area or uh, regions, um, or we can have a uh, smaller addressable space and have byte aligned regions, which for us doing sandboxing is great because we want to be able to um, say, okay, here's a data structure and in place, not modify the code, just map that into my sandbox. Um, and the way that we um, access those regions is, right, so we have these four regions and we actually, in the x86, add new instructions, right? And so the region number is actually encoded in the instruction. And the reason that we do this is because we don't want to change the expressiveness of uh, the x86 move instruction, right? So we still get all of our addressing modes. We don't have to constrain our compiler at all, but we get this nice restriction. There is that one additional restriction um, that our index uh, now needs to be positive, but as far as we can tell, that's not a, a, a significant restriction in terms of compiler optimization. And we can do this with one 32-bit comparator, again, because instead of having to check an upper and lower bound, right, we just uh, have to do one upper bound check. So the other type of region we have are called implicit data regions. And so um, these get applied to every load and store. Um, again, this is similar to, uh, if you're used to the x86-32 world, this is a similar idea, right? So for every memory operation, we're gonna go through our regions and we're gonna say, okay, are you in this range? And if you are in this range, do the permissions match, right? If it's a load, then I'm gonna need a read permission. Um, and if everything lines up, right, then I'm gonna execute that load. I've got four implicit data regions. And then I've got two code regions. And so these, my implicit regions, I just use masking, right? I, um, so I'm not using a comparator at all, just simple ands and ors. And so again, this brings um, size alignment restrictions, but um, we have our explicit data regions when we need more granular access. And for heaps, for larger areas of memory, right? I think this, this gives us the expressiveness that we need. And so these choices, right, these like, you know, why do we have four, why do we have two, came out of our experience with sandboxing lots of different code. Um, our colleagues at Fastly were like, you know, what, what's the number that we need? Of course, um, you know, we can spill these and reuse them, but we don't want to do that too much. And so, you know, sometimes you pick magic numbers, and these are our magic numbers. So just regions are not enough, though, right? So we don't just need memory isolation. We need to have some uh, grasp on control. So uh, I don't know, a couple of years ago, Shravan and I were talking about this, and he's like, what should we do about system calls? I'm like, man, I've written like, you know, kernel level system call interposition mechanisms, I've written library interposition mechanisms, and I hate them all, right? This is what I want, right? I just want the support from the processor. So if you've done this before, it like hurts so much, and it's, it's really great to just be able to like, oh, okay, like here are all of my different, you know, sys enter, int id or whatever, it's just gonna redirect those to a handler. So if you exit the sandbox or you make a system call, it just hands it right off to the runtime. And again, like unless you've been through the pain, like you, you don't appreciate like how great this is. <laughs> like I hate ptrace so much. <laughs> um, and again, this is implementable with a simple conditional logic, uh, you know, if a smaller processor or microcode if you're on something like a big x86 core. So HFI has these isolation primitives. Um, our explicit data regions are great. They're, they're great for WASM because we can use them for, for WASM heaps, for, for WASM linear memories. Um, explicit data or implicit regions um, are great for protecting the runtime itself from specter attacks. Uh, also for code regions, right? So uh, 
software CFI that wasn't relies on is not spectre safe, but we can use these regions to make it spectre safe. Um, and then for native isolation, right, we can reuse kind of, you know, pretty much all these same mechanisms. And explicit data regions, right, if you can actually change your native app, you can use it for sharing too. Um, so we've kind of got this very cool kind of like two-in-one solution here. So, so how does it perform? Right, so way better than bounce checks. <laughs> we get a little speed up over guard regions, um, uh, you know, sort of across the board. And, um, but we can do this on 32-bit processors. We can do this on 64-bit memories. Um, we can do this without worrying about Spectre. We can do this without scaling limits. Um, and for some workloads, uh, we actually see a, you know, a, bigger, a bigger boost, right? Uh, like with Firefox image rendering, rendering we see this like, pretty big speed up from uh, getting rid of the overheads of, of bounce checking. So good, so I have some time for questions. That went a little bit faster than I was planning, but, but it's okay. Um, so, so what can you do? Um, if you're interested in this, you know, so first of all, ask your runtime vendor about Segway and ColorGuard. Uh, I'm, I'm looking around. There's some guy over there that's supposed to implement ColorGuard in Wasm time. So he, he's on the hook now. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so we're, uh, we're working on getting this stuff out there into, into production for, for folks to play with. Um, if you're interested in HFI, um, come talk to us or talk to your CPU vendor about uh, HFI support. So right, we've been working, you know, talking with folks at Intel, talking with folks at RISC-V and, and, and working within the, that standards body. And right, basically, like the money in the bank with pushing architecture features is big vendors who are saying, right, this is exactly what we want. Like when we talk to the, the Chrome guys, they're like, okay, this is exactly what we want for like, you know, sandboxing V8. And so, right, if we have people from cloud vendors, you know, if you're like, uh, or, you know, if you're a company that's like, yes, this is what we want, please talk to us, because um, your voice matters so much. Um, and then finally, come talk to us about your production needs, um, right? If Color Guard, if the scalability or performance things could be a benefit to you, we'd really like to know. Um, uh, you know, Shravan and I, like the UCSD UT crew, like, you know, we're all about like performance, scalability, security. Um, so, you know, if you have practical challenges, we'd like to know about your workloads and, uh, and how we can help. Um, so I'd love to take some questions if you guys, if you guys have some. Um, things are going well with the people in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. They're kind of secretive. I don't want to scare them away like a small animal. Um, and, and, we have, and we have really good, I think, uh, support and momentum in the RISC-V community. We haven't uh, made good connections in the ARM world, so if you know folks in the ARM world, uh, that would be great. But no, I mean, look, I mean, Intel, uh, Intel folks were involved with the design of this. Um, and so, yeah, so there's, there's definitely a lot, a lot of interest there. And, um, and then some of those folks went to, to Revos and are in the RISC-V community. So it, there's a lot of first-person involvement, which is, yeah, ownership is, is good. Did you have a question? Oh, no, no, so. So, so there used to be like six different segment registers. Four of them now just do nothing, right? Four of them now, if you do segment relative, it will just be relative to zero. Two of them actually still do segment relative. They don't do bounce checks anymore. Um, when they were first added, you couldn't access them from user space. But then in Ivy Bridge, probably like 12 years ago or something, um, Intel made it possible to access those from user space. So those are, yeah, those, so we use them for the real level storage. So they are, they are there on every core and yeah, you can just use them. So, so where does the state color go? Oh, MPK. Oh, yeah, so MPK, right, so um, each thread, like uh, your thread will use the, the PKRU register and say, okay, here's the color that my current thread can access. Because you're only, you know, running one thread at a time. Yeah. Yeah. Core. yeah. yeah. And, I mean, and if you have hyper threads, right, each of those is going to have its own PKRU register. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, 
Um, for which stuff? For like, uh, like, where's the, uh, for HFI? What? You mean for HFI or for Segway and Color Guard? Uh, for the Color Guard. Oh, Color Guard is only available on like modern x86 hardware, which is 64 bit. Um, so ARM is going to have MTE coming out on like Cortex stuff, but I think it's probably going to be bigger Cortex stuff. So I don't think we're going to see that down at like 16 bit sizes. We'll have to figure something else out, but we'll talk about that. <laughs> other, other questions? If you're sitting on something where you're like, man, I just have this like really confrontational question, right? I'm Israeli, so like, it's like really hard to offend me. <laughs> What's that? With HFI? Yeah. Um, hard, it's easier and simpler, you mean, than like page based? Of course, but how many guys you need to have to do that? Whenever I set the memory, they always detect the bundle. And then, yeah, when you run the people from then below the bundle of the two register, right? The bundle of the memory that um, you have set. Then whenever Sorry, you're saying so that I don't think I quite understand the question. Okay. Yeah. The point is that you still accept inside the boundary to be fine, right? The memory boundary. Um, if not, then it will fail, right? Oh, yeah. Sorry, so with HFI, yeah, I mean, as long as the check so is in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it does the, does the checks in parallel. Yeah, so you don't pay anything. Yeah, it's not that difficult for hardware to do that. No. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, it definitely, I mean, simplifies your implementation a lot. Um, I mean, I mean, this, right, I mean, so for me, like, there's, there's this analogy to kind of like hardware virtualization. And like, right, so when I was at VMware, like when I started, right, it took like a room of like the smartest people that I know to virtualize the x86. I mean, right, the original VMware system, right, like the way that we dealt with the fact that x86 wasn't virtualizable was that we like literally did a JIT for x86. Like we had the hotspot guys working on this, right? This is badass. And like nobody had this for like five years, All right? Once like hardware virtualization came out, once we had like VT and EPT, Right, like writing a virtual machine monitor is like a project for a graduate student, right? It's not like, I mean, the bar got so much lower. And I think the HFI could do the same thing, right? In terms of like doing fine grained isolation instead of having to like modify, you know, Python for years and like have a, like a WASM, you know, a WASM compiler and like all this stuff, right? You know, you just like set up some regions and go. So I think it, it really, really will lower the bar for fine grained isolation and like open up a lot of new possibilities uh, for like how we can be doing serverless, how we can be doing security. So one last question for clarity. Yeah. Uh, HFI versus Intel. So is uh, Intel only IP here? No. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, so, I mean, it's published. Right. We're going to, so I, 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 had, I got to, I could have a fight with the people at UCSD, and they're like, you should, like, you know, file blah, blah, blah stuff. And I saw that, like, this is why we are not going to file IP on it. So, I mean, I could have just, like, wait them out for another five months, and then it will be in the public domain. But no, I think it's because, because it's been done with, like, UCSD and so many other folks, right? And because it's going to be in the public domain, it's not encumbered. Um, and then, you know, the work, obviously, with RISC-V will be all royalty free. We're kind of trying to let everybody know we're like the opposite of the secret sauce. Um, any other, other questions?
Segway, yes. Uh, color guard, no. Yeah? Yeah. Well, so, so it will help you with a Bates addition, but you still have to do the conditional check yourself. Um, like, I don't think we have a good answer for like, how do you make, like, I don't think we can make 64-bit memories like, very fast. Um, we're just gonna need better hardware. Have you designed for I mean, you could design other stuff, but like, it's the only path forward I know right now, <laughs> and I'm looking. <laughs> Anyone else, any thoughts? We've got two more minutes here. Shropping, you wanna troll me? You wanna troll me? <laughs> ben, you wanna troll me? <laughs> okay, cool. What's that, 128 bit memories? I've had people like Intel be like, you know, I think it's, you know, like, at some point, we're going to need 120 bit addressing. I'm like, I think the physics gets hard around that one. Like, but maybe you know, you, you can do a lot with those like hard, harder bits, right? You know, we keep on being like, what do we do with these uh, these top unused bits? With 120 bits, we could have a lot a lot of stuff to do. Anyway, thank you so much, everybody, for coming. Really appreciate it. Um, and please uh, come talk to us after. Uh, yeah, love to chat more about this. <laughs>